Hello, nerds. It's me, Jamie, or as I like to call myself, the Story Girl. Back at it again with another story makeover for Rings of Power, the flop mourned round the world. Can I reimagine this turd of a show into something that is thoroughly watchable and that makes complete sense? I'm afraid not. Rings of Power is too big of a narrative mess. But I will offer what improvements I can, at least until I get bored of doing so and move on to other material. Now I will admit, though I probably come off sounding very harsh against this show, I don't actually hate Rings of Power. It's deeply flawed, but it does have its good points, and I'm curious to see what they'll do in season two. I think shows are like people. Love them for who they are, enjoy them for what they can give, and if you can't stand them any longer, quietly stop watching. With that being said, my husband has been homesick this week, and we've been re-watching The Lord of the Rings together. The difference in quality between those classic movies and this fan-fiction fever dream of a show is astounding. So, let's do a makeover. Let's do a makeover. <gasps> Last week, I promised to talk more about Baby Gandalf. I think I've said pretty much everything I wanted to say about him. Mainly that it's a crime we didn't get to see Baby Gandalf relax and make friends with the Harfoots. Instead, everything was oddly tense and uncomfortable the whole time. If I were Baby Gandalf, after the reception they gave me, I'd bid those small, strange leprechauns goodbye and never look back. I do have one more thing to add. I don't buy it for one nanosecond that Nori's parents would ever send their child off into the wilderness with Baby Gandalf. Sure, Baby Gandalf is good and will take care of Nori. I'm good. But the world is wide and wild, Harfoots are homebodies, and Nori is still a child. No way would any sane parents, especially Harfoot parents, send their young daughter off into the wilderness with a vagabond. And why does Nori need to go? No explanation is offered. As far as I can tell, Nori didn't even ask to go. There's a super easy fix for this, too. Because baby Gandalf is so very new to the world, as a gesture of friendship and goodwill, Largo Brandyfoot, Nori's dad, could have offered to act as a guide to baby Gandalf for a time, escorting him to the borders of their known territory. And, knowing that his daughter Nori has always longed for an adventure, Largo could have invited Nori to go with them. Now that I would have bought, also, I think the trio of Largo, Nori, and Baby Gandalf would be much more fun to watch, rather than just Nori and Baby Gandalf by themselves. Heck, I think Poppy would have been a good addition as well. But no, we just get Baby Gandalf and Nori jaunting off into the wilderness alone for no reason at all. And to add insult to injury, it's prefaced by the longest, most awkward goodbye scene in the history of television. Moving on, it's time to talk about a Sildor. I've been itching to give him a makeover since his dopey, depressed face first appeared on my TV screen. Out of all the characters in Rings of Power, he is the worst. The most bland, pointless, and annoying. The most poorly written, ill-conceived, and incorrectly cast character of the entire collection. And what irritates me so greatly is that Isildur absolutely should have been one of the best, most interesting, and relatable characters. I don't fault the actor, Maxim Baldry. He was given a shitty script, and there's not much he could do about that. While doing research for this video, I discovered that he played Stepan in Mr. Bean's Holiday. That alone makes me forgive him. But he simply isn't the right actor for this role. Sildor is Aragorn's ancestor, a legendary Numenorean warrior of old who cut the ring from Sauron's hand, defeating Sauron and saving Middle-earth but who, instead of retaining his honor, fell all too easily to the seductive power of the ring. Instead of destroying the ring when he had the chance, Isildur takes it for himself, thus tarnishing his legacy and ensuring that evil will rise again. Destroy it! No. Isildur's failure hangs heavy on Aragorn's shoulders. Aragorn grows up knowing that he is meant to reclaim the throne of Gondor, but he doubts himself and runs from his destiny, fearful that he will succumb to the same weakness that corrupted Isildur. This inner conflict informs Aragorn's powerful story arc from Strider, a reclusive ranger who wanders from place to place, refusing to claim the throne, to Aragorn, a fully realized, confident, kind, and powerful king, Isildur as he should have been. Instead of fulfilling his destiny, Isildur fell, and his fall was great. But to have a great fall, you have to have greatness within you in the first place. I see next to none of that greatness in the Isildur of the Rings of Power. 
Instead, he's an annoying, whiny man-child with no work ethic, no charisma, and no substantial ambition that moves the story forward. So, let's give this Isildur a makeover. First of all, we need to recast him with someone who looks the part. Sorry, Maxim. If the showrunners seriously thought they could trick us into thinking this man could descend from this man, they thought wrong. I have nothing against Maxim Baldry's looks. He's a handsome guy. But his essence is totally different from the Aragorn that we know. Of course, one could argue that this show is set in a different universe, and there is no need to consider the Aragorn that we know to inform the casting for Isildur. However, I simply don't agree with that, and this is my story makeover, so... Let's recast Isildur with someone who gives tough, rugged, and Aragorn-esque vibes. Maxim Baldry can play Isildur's friend. By the way, I don't know why Isildur has two friends in this show when one would do. It's story clutter if you ask me. Now let's give Isildur an ambition, some kind of discernible, non-vague goal. After watching Isildur's scenes in Rings of Power for a second time, I figured out that he wants to go to Middle-earth, but he's never very clear about this goal. It's never explained why he wants to go, what he wants to do when he gets there, or how he is preparing for his journey. So, let's fix that. Let's say Isildur is determined to make it to Middle-earth. He's gathering supplies. He's trying to convince his friends to come with him. He's studying swordplay, elvish, and Middle-earth history. And he's arguing with his father, Elendil, who wants him to rejoin the Sea Guard. Because, instead of making an intentional mistake and getting fired on purpose like an annoying whiny child, Isildur gave his resignation like a man. Isildur is a competent young sailor who can think on his feet and is great in a crisis. Elendil doesn't understand why his son has thrown away a valuable career path in pursuit of what he sees as a fruitless scheme. When Isildur learns that his father is leading an expedition to Middle-earth, he sees this as his chance and asks for a spot on the ship. Elendil refuses, stating that he knows Isildur is just trying to get to Middle-earth, and he knows he would desert and refuse to come back home. Isildur responds with, True, but why do you not support my dream? And they can have some good old father-son conflict. By the way, conflict drives plot and is essential to any great story. But layering conflict too thickly is a common amateur writing mistake. When there's manufactured over-the-top conflict every time you turn around, that's a clear sign that the writer doesn't know what their story is about. Now let's redeem the Galadriel street sword fighting scene. Tons of people have complained about this scene, and for good reason. As it stands right now, this scene does absolutely nothing to drive the plot forward. It's merely an opportunity for Galadriel to show off her fancy footwork under the guise of teaching the cadets. In my opinion, it's not effective teaching, and it makes her look braggadocious. So, when Isildur hears that his father has promised a lieutenantship to whoever can draw blood, he takes up a sword and challenges Galadriel. They have a real sparring session, because Isildur has real skill with a blade. He's holding his own, and Galadriel has to work hard to defeat him. Elendil and the onlookers watch the scene unfold in growing admiration for the skill of the two contestants. Finally, Isildur nicks Galadriel's shoulder, drawing a few drops of blood. The crowd erupts in cheers. Elendil's face is unreadable. Isildur immediately approaches his father and reminds him of his promise, that anyone who draws blood from Galadriel will be promoted to lieutenant. Elendil is a man of his word, so he relents, and Isildur is granted the role of lieutenant and a place on the ship. I'm so mad they didn't think to do this in the actual show. In the show, Isildur is like, please can I come? And Elendil is like, no. And then later, it cuts to Isildur boarding the ship, with no explanation whatsoever for why Elendil changed his mind. It truly makes no sense. Stories have to make sense, guys. Things can't just happen because you want them to happen. There has to be a logical chain of cause and effect. Anyway, moving on. Let's add some scenes hinting at the darkness within him, foreshadowing his ultimate demise. Perhaps a scene of Isildur drinking too much, hinting of a deep sorrow over the death of his mother that he is desperately trying to ignore, and also hinting at an addictive personality that will one day fall prey to the ring. We need to see his hubris. Isildur believes he's invincible never imagining that he will be remembered in the ages to come as one of the weakest men who ever shaped the course of Middle-earth history. Well, that's all I have for today. I had a lot of fun writing this video. So, what did you guys think? If you guys liked it, didn't like it, 
or have story makeover suggestions of your own, I'd love to hear about it down in the comments. Please share, like, subscribe, etc. if you want to. Thanks for listening. Goodbye, nerds.